So I was saying that we started to to develop some projects in this field, in the brain computer interface field, around 15 years ago. But we tried to control external devices by using EV signals. But where, you know, like external devices, like a robot, an industrial robot, as for instance, you can see here or here. But we decided that we can apply all this knowledge to try to control exoskeleton. Why? Because, you know, exoskeleton are robots, but they can be used for helping people to walk or, or to move their legs. So what we're going to do today is to talk about this kind of projects, the projects that we have developed where we are trying to help people to walk or to move their legs by using brain computer interfaces. So my, the, my, my own line is going to be this. I want to talk very briefly about brain machine interfaces, why we think that they are useful for commanding exoskeleton. And then I will explain several examples for, you know, using VCIs for commanding upper limb and lower limb exoskeleton. Well, why we think that it's very useful to use brain computer interfaces combined with exoskeleton? As you know, a stroke and a spinal cord injury are very common causes of, you know, motor limitation of people. So basically, as you can see here in this video, when a person has suffered a stroke, for instance, or, a, you know, our spinal cord injury, they have some problems related with the, with, related with the motor function. For instance, in this case, you can see here, the person has some difficulty for walking. And when a person has suffered this kind of accident, what well, they do usually is, you know, to try to recover this function by using some kind of rehabilitation. But the problem is that what is actually done in the, you know, in the clinical scenario is to follow this kind of traditional motor rehabilitation. When, when we follow is a bottom-up approach. I mean, usually, as you can see here, for instance, in this case, the person has problem for walking. So what we do here is to try to move their limbs. I mean, we have to try to move the legs of the person in order to try to influence the nervous system of the person. So. We want to improve the neuroplasticity of the brain, but we are not, you know, acting on the brain, but we are acting on the lower limb of the person. Why? Because it is known that we do that, we are going to try to promote the mechanism of the neuroplasticity of the brain. So in the end, as you can see here, this kind of rehabilitation is very hard because we need at least three people for helping the person to try to do the rehabilitation. And in addition, we have to follow very repetitive movement. So in this case, it will be easier if we do this kind of rehabilitation by using, for instance, exoskeleton. Well, as you know, an exoskeleton is, is a robot. In the end, it's a robot. So they have actuator, they have links, but these actuators are located in the places where we have our joint, where we have, for instance, our knee or hip. So the good thing about robot is that they can do a lot of times a very you know very precise very accurate uh, repetitive movement so we don't need additional people for helping the person to walk so this is very important but i mean in this case what we are trying to do is to emulate the traditional rehabilitation i mean again we are moving for instance the leg of the person in order to try to promote the neuroplasticity of the brain but this is, in the end, the traditional rehabilitation approach. We are not doing anything new. So what we think that it would be better for the patient would be, you know, to try to combine the brain-computer interfaces with exoskeletons. Why? Because in this case, we are going to try to do two things at the same time. I mean, on the one hand, the person is moving their legs, so we are going to try to promote the neuroplasticity, but at the same time, we are going to ask the person, one thing is that if you want to move your legs, you have to think about moving your legs. So that way, what we're trying to do is to promote the neuroplasticity of the brain because we are trying to combine two different approaches, the bottom-up approach, but at the same time, we are trying to introduce the top-down approach. So we are trying to do at the same time both things, because this is what the human does in a natural way, okay? 
So, basically, uh, the scheme that we are going to try to implement is this one that is put in this place on the, uh, on the slide. As you can see here, first of all, we have to uh, acquire the EG signal of the person, and after that, we have to do some kind of processing in order to know if the person wants to walk or wants to stop. Or if the person wants, for instance, to move his or her arm or not. So basically, this is the idea of our project. We are trying to improve current therapy by trying to combine these both approaches. Okay, so let me start, first of all, with the brain-computer interfaces that we have developed for commanding utterly esoteric. So for that kind of project, I would like to present this project that is called brain to motion It's a project that we developed some years ago. It was done in collaboration with several centers, with the SIC in Madrid, and also with a, with a hospital in Alicante. And this project has different goals, but here I'm going to present only this goal. The goal was basically, is we are going to try to move the upper limb of the person by using an exoskeleton, and we are going to do that, we are going to try to decode the brain signals of the person. And we are going to do that by following two different approaches. One approach is based on detecting the motor imagery of the person, and the other one is based on trying to detect the intention of moving the arm before the movement really happens. And also the goal was to do some kind of usability test with patient in order to check if the patient were able or not to command the sustainable. So let me present the scheme of the system that we developed. Basically, what we do is, first of all, we have to collect the EG signals. As you can see here, we were using, you know, a non-invasive device. Uh, we are using uh, 16 electrodes that are more or less placed in all the motor area of the person. And we focus on only detecting two kinds of approaches for moving the arm of the person. I mean, basically, we wanted to do an extension of the arm of the person and to do a flexion. So basically, this was the only movement that we wanted to do by using this combination of brain-computer interface and exoskeleton. So that way, our idea was, okay, if I want to move my arm, I have to think about moving my arm, or I have to try to move my arm. Okay, so for doing that, we use this exoskeleton. It's, it's a commercial exoskeleton. It's, it's from Hokoma, the, the Hokoma Armour Spring. But this exoskeleton has a little problem. Is yes, that the exoskeleton doesn't have any kind of actuator. Only you, you can use that for holding your arm, but it doesn't have actuator. I mean, it doesn't have any kind of motor for moving your arm. But the good thing is that we were focusing on, on people that have suffered a stroke, but they were not affected in their muscles. So they had the muscle. So the actuator that we used was the muscle of the person. So basically what we did is, okay, if we want to move the arm of the person, we are going to stimulate the muscle of the person to produce the movement of the arm, okay? So as you can see here in this scheme, after registering the signal, what we do is we do the processing and we send a command to an stimulator in order to activate the muscle and in the end produce the movement of extension or flexion of the arm of the person. Okay? So, as I have said before, we wanted to do some experiment with, with real patients. So, we collaborated with this hospital in Alicante and we tested the system with five patients, four of them have suffered a stroke, and the last one has suffered a traumatic brain injury. So we developed two different approaches for developing the brain-computer interface. The third one was based on trying to detect the imagination of moving your hand. I mean, basically it was, okay, if I want to move my arm, I have to think that I'm moving my hand. We focus on moving the hand because it was easier to detect from the EG signal. So basically, was the, the procedure was the following. I mean, I am in, you know, in the relaxed state. I, I am with my arm flex. If I want to do the extension, I have to move. I have to think, sorry, about a movement of my hand. 
And when I have my R extended, if I want to do the flexion, I have to repeat the procedure. Again, I have to think that I'm moving my hand. And that way, the person is all the time in charge of his or her rehabilitation. So, of course, we did some kind of, you know, a processing, pre processing for removing, you know, artifacts and that. And for extracting the main feature of the EV signal, we did the periodogram. And after that, we used the super vector machine for detecting only two states. I mean, I am thinking about moving my hand or not. I am in the relaxed state. So let me show you here one video with one of the patients. As you can see here, first of all, the person is in the relaxed state. And in the screen, it's going to be appear. You can see here, it's going to appear a hand. It means that the person has to think about movement of his, in this case, her, her hand. And when the VCI detects that, the VCI sends a command to the stimulator and the muscle produces the movement of the arrow of the person. So again, if the person wants to do the flexion, we have to repeat the procedure. Again, the person has to think that he or her is moving, acuerdo, the arm. But as you can see here, for instance, in that case, the VCI hasn't detected the touch, so we have to repeat again the procedure. We have to ask again the user, okay, think about that again. So the good thing is that the person is in charge of the time acuerdo, of the rehabilitation. I mean, there is not a person that is actually moving the arm of the person. It's the own person, okay? So we think that this is gonna be better for the patient because at the same time, we are, you know, stimulating the brain of the person. And on the other hand, we are producing the movement of the person in the in, in the arm. So you can see here in the table, some results that we got. We can focus, for instance, in the accuracy. And we can see here that the results are very dependent of the user. For instance, we can see here that with two users, we get results higher than 70%. It's also important to focus on the false positive results. You know, false positive is when, for instance, I am in the relaxed state and suddenly my arm is moved. We have to try to reduce that rate. So, in, for instance, in the same case, in the better case, we only get two false positives in one of the cases. Anyway, we decided to try to improve this VCI. So, we developed a different VCI. In this case, we tried to detect the intention of performing the movement actually, you know, really uh, before it really happened. So for instance, if I have to grasp, you know, this pointer, I'm not starting thinking, okay, I'm going to grasp this, I don't do that. So I try to grasp it, okay? But if the person has a prior stop, the person is not able to do that. But the person can try to do the movement. So in this case, we say that people, okay, you have to try to do the movement and we are going to detect that you have tried to do that. And for doing that, the approach that we used was the paradigm of the event related desynchronization. So we know that as there is a decrease of the spectral power just before the movement is done. So we developed a different algorithm. In this case, it was based on the fast Fourier dashboard. And we used a super vector machine for detecting when the person wants to move so it wants to try to move the arm or not. So let me show here another video with the same patient, but using a different procedure. So first of all, you can see here that the person is in the relaxed state. And now on the screen, you can see here that appear an image saying, okay, you have to try to do your extension on your arm. So the person can do that, but the VCI can detect that the person wants to do that. So we send the command for performing the extension of the app. And we can repeat the procedure. Now we can we can say again, okay, try to do the flexion. So the person is not able to do that, but is gonna try. So we are going to detect that and we are able to perform the movement of the flexion. So again, the person is all the time in charge of his or her rehabilitation. So you can see here the result that we got. We can verify that, for instance, the accuracy of the system was better than in the previous case. But in some cases, you know, the false positive 
the percentage, the rate of the false positive was quite high. So anyway, you know, the system has to be trained for its user. I, I haven't said anything about that before, but basically each user did around two or three sessions of training before using the system. So I can conclude that, you know, for both experiments, for both approaches, people are able to command the system. Only one of the patients didn't get very good results, but it was because these patients show an important attention deficit that affected the training. Anyway, I mean, we have checked that the system can be used by patients, but we are not saying that this is better than a traditional rehabilitation. We don't know yet if this is better than actually moving the arm of the person by a therapist, for instance. So we have to do clinical trials in order to check if the rehabilitation is better because maybe it's faster or maybe because we are recovering more uh, functions. Okay, so let me now move to the project that we have developed related with BCIs for commanding lower limb exoskeleton. The third project that I want to start to talk about that is the associate project. This was a project that was done in collaboration with several centers, in this case with the facility in Madrid, with a hospital in Valencia that is called La Fer, and also with the main hospital of paraplegics in Spain that is in Toledo. So the idea of this project was try to develop a new therapy for, for spinal cord injury people that try to combine different approaches for, you know, trying to recover the functionality that has been lost relative with it. So what we try to do is basically promote the motor control relevant by associating three aspects. That was the motor planning at the brain level, the sensory stimulation at the cortical level, and finally, the afferent feedback provided by an associate. And for doing that, we did the following. I mean, first, we developed a BCI based on motor imagery for controlling the exoskeleton. This way, we can associate the motor planning at the brain level with the afferent feedback provided by the exoskeleton. I mean, in this case, we develop a brain computative phase where you have to think about moving your legs if you want to work with the exoskeleton. So that way we are connecting the exoskeleton and the brain. But on the other hand, we develop a strategy for stimulating the brain. I mean, we develop a strategy based on transcranial different current stimulation in order to stimulate the brain by applying very, very small, you know, uh, electrical current. I have to say that in this case, when we apply the transcranial different current stimulation, the TPS, we try to improve the sensory motor plasticity of the brain, but also we try to improve the quality of the signal that are being used for, you know, registering the brain activity of the person. So before I started to talk about, you know, the VCI, let me talk very briefly about the TPA strategy that we implemented. Well, I'm, I'm not sure if you are, you know, uh, you know TPS, uh, you know this kind of technology. I, I, I will be very briefly. I mean, basically, in order to stimulate the brain by applying uh, a current, you have to use at least two electrodes. One, that's the, is the anode. You are going to use that uh, this this electrode for, you know, for putting the current into the brain. And the other is the cathode that you're going to put that path to that electrode in order to recover the electricity. So basically, the area where you put the anode is going to be, is going, is going to have more excitability. But as a positive, in the area when you put the cathode, what you're going to have is less plasticity. So that way, it's very important to decide where you're going, you, where you're going to put the electrode for stimulating the brain and where you are going to put the electrode for, you know, decreasing the excitability of the electrode. In our case, we were interested in two different kinds of patients. I have said before, we were interested in a spinal cord injury patient, but we are also interested on stroke patients. In this case, we decided one strategy of stimulation, thinking about 
people that were affected on the right leg. I mean, they were having problems for walking, but they were mostly affected on the right leg. As we know, if we want to stimulate the other leg with the legs and the brain, are just in the middle of both hemispheres. Okay, because here you have the, the monculus of Penfield. We can see here that the, represent, the representation of the legs is just in the middle of both hemispheres. So we have to try to stimulate that area. But on the other hand, we know that the, you know, the right part of the cerebellum is also in charge of some parameters related with the legs, like for instance, stability, etc. So basically, what we did is okay, we are going to put two electrodes for trying to stimulate that area, I mean, one in order to stimulate the cerebellum, the right part of the cerebellum, and the other in order to try to stimulate just in the middle of both hemispheres. And of course, we need to put at least another electrode in order to recover all the electricity that we have introduced in the brain. So in this case, we put the cathode in this case, in this place, sorry. So I would like to say that after, you know, deciding this kind of a strategy, we did some kind of simulation in order to check what region are actually stimulated. As you can see here, we check that, okay, we are stimulating just in the middle of both hemispheres, and also we are stimulating on the right part of the cerebral, okay? So what we did is before starting the experiment with the people with the VCI and the exoskeleton, we stimulated the brain of the person during fishing. I will explain this later. But as we have said before, we needed to implement a VCI for commanding the subscriber. In this case, the VCI was only, you know, capable of detecting two different mental tasks. One is related with gait imagination. I mean, I have to think about moving my legs. And the other one was related with vibrato. Okay, so basically, if, if I want to walk, I have to be all the time thinking about my legs. For instance, that I am walking. If I want to stop, I have to relax. So in this case, we register 30 electrodes, non-invasive, but basically we were interested on the green electrodes that you can see here, that are placed on the motor map. So of course, we perform some preprocessing in order to you know, improve the quality of the signal, but the important thing here is that we extract nice features in this case, and that feature were basically the power at the frequency that presented the maximum variation between the relaxed and the gain imagination. So in this case, you know, for each processing window, we implemented or we extracted a vector with nice feature that was the input for the super retromacy. Okay. Well, so taking that into account, we developed this protocol in order to train the system and in order to test the system. So as I said before, first of all, the person received 15 minutes of a simulation. I mean, the person is, for instance, with the ED card or in this case with the TTS card, it's the same. And the person received 15 minutes of a simulation. I have to say, that there were two groups of people one that was actually receiving the stimulation and the other one that didn't receive any kind of a stimulation we said that people okay you are going to receive the stimulation but they were equally they weren't stimulated only only to check if there was some kind of you know placebo effect after that after you know being stimulated we started to train the system. I mean, we started to train the uh, classifier. And for doing that, what we did is 40 trial of training. In each trial, we did the following. First of all, the person was relaxed. And after that, the person heard an acoustic sound and started to imagine that the person was walking, okay? But at the same time that the person was thinking about the rest, the subscription was externally moved. I mean, at the same time that the person was thinking about working, 
this statement was moved. I mean, the person wasn't the person wasn't controlling the movement of the exoskeleton. The exoskeleton was automatically moved. Okay, and after that, the person heard again another acoustic sound, and the person was in the relaxed state. Well, after the training, I mean, after adjusting the classifier for each person, the person did the testing. Okay. And the testing is quite similar, but there is an important difference is that in this case, you know, during the imagination, the exoskeleton is only moved if the BCI is detecting that the person is actually thinking about moving his or her life. Okay. So this protocol was followed for each person during five consecutive days. Okay. In order to check that if there is some improvement during the days, and in order to be sure that the person has trained enough for using the system. So let me show you here one of the videos, one of the experiments that we did with uh, people in the hospital paraplegics. So I don't know if, if we are going to hear the sound. Let me, let me. I think. Well, I'm going to tell that because I think that the sound is soft. But basically, the person is in the first, first of all, is relaxed. The person hear that sound, and after hearing that sound, the person starts, you know, to think about moving his or her legs. When the BCI detects that, the BCI starts to command the exoskeleton, and the exoskeleton is being controlled if the person is all the time thinking about that, I mean, if there is some moment that the person is not thinking about that, the exoskeleton is stopped. So I have to say that after performing this experiment, we check that actually there were difference between the group that was being stimulated and the group that didn't receive any kind of stimulation. I mean, here you can see in blue that the accuracy of the BCI was bigger than 80%. And the accuracy of the sham group, I mean, the group that didn't receive the stimulation, was around 75%. Even if we check the accuracy every day, we also verify that the accuracy was better for the uh, active group. Anyway, about this project, we check that, okay, people can use the VCI for commanding the exoskeleton using motor imagery. And we have said that even we can use the PTS for improving the quality of the signal that are being collected for, you know, implementing the DCI. But we need to check if the brain plasticity is improving by associating this stimulation with the DCI. And also, for doing that, we need to perform clinical trials. So we only need, you know, some usually tests. Anyway, taking into account the result that we got in that project, we developed a different project, is the world project, that this project was focused on trying to improve the brain machine interfaces for commanding exoskeletons. I mean, we wanted to try to get more robust brain computer interface. It was a project that we did in collaboration also with several centers, with the main hospital of paraplegics in Spain, in Toledo, also with the University of Houston, and also with a hospital in Asturias. So basically in this project, we have a lot of different goals. Here, I'm going to talk only about three, three talks, three goals, sorry. That was, first of all, try to develop a robust BCI for commanding the subtitle, and also to try to improve the training of the BCI, in this case by using virtual reality, and finally to perform some usability tests with, with people, with this spinal cord injury people. So one of the problems that we detected in, in the last project was that, you know, there were a lot of false positives when we tried to command the society. So there were some times that the person was in the relaxed state, and suddenly the BCI detected that the person wanted to move. So we try to, first of all, to try to try to reduce that rate. And for doing that, we what we did is to combine two different approaches for commanding the hospital. 
we try to combine the motor imagery approach with the attention level of the user during the game. I mean, if we are working, basically, we can be very focused on working, or I can be, you know, distracted, with moving, uh, I don't know, reading my phone or iPhone. Anyway, so in that case, we decided, okay, if I want to control the skeleton, I need to be thinking about moving my leg, but at the same time, I have to be focused on, on the game. I mean, I cannot, you know, thinking about other things. So we try to develop this new approach, combining, you know, the motor imagery with attention level of the user. And we did some experiment with people, you know, wearing an exoskeleton, the A3 from Signal, in order to be controlled only by using EG Signal. So for doing that, we implementing this protocol. In this protocol, what we did is first of all, very good, I trained, I trained the system with only one classifier for all the possibilities when we are we are using the exoskeleton. I mean. In the previous project, I use only one classifier, even if I am stopped, or even if I am working with the skeleton. In this case, we change that paradigm and we decide, okay, so I'm going to train the system for one classifier that I'm going to use it when I am still, I mean, when I am stand and I'm not working with the skeleton. And on the other hand, I'm going to train some classifiers to be used when the person is working, okay? So, what we did is, okay, for the training, we are going to follow these, uh, you know, trials where the person is in relaxed state. And after that, the, the person has to think about moving his legs. And after that, the person has to try to do some mathematical operation. Why mathematical operation? Because we have to try to, you know, be sure that the person is not focused on working. Okay, because one of the things that we wanted to do is to be sure that we can evaluate the attention of the person during the game. Okay, so in that way, if we, if we ask the person to perform some mathematical operation, we are sure that the person is not going to be focused on the game. Okay, and we repeat this protocol of training during 10 trials, considering first of all that the person is still, but also we repeat we repeated the, the same protocol when the person was working with the system. Okay? And after doing that, what we did is the real experiment in closer. But in this case, we did five trials. And in this case, I mean, the person performed you know, the motor imagery. And during the motor imagery, the system was controlled by the BCI only if the attention level of the user and the motor imagery was detected in a right way. Well, I'm not going to go, uh, I, I'm not going to discuss a lot of the detail of the signal processing algorithms, but I have to say that we developed two different kinds of algorithms. One algorithm are related with detecting the attention level of the user. So in this case, basically what we did is, okay, we are going to try to get an index between zero and one, and sorry. I don't know if the video is being shown. Ah, okay. We are providing an index between zero and one. For instance, you can see here that the index is zero because the person is working, but at the same time is watching one screen when he's doing some mathematical operation. On the other hand, we provided an index around 0 0.5 if the person is working, but the person is not very focused on the, on the work. You know, for instance, the person is working, but the person is not, you know, I don't know why the video is not showing. Okay. And finally, we provided an index of one if the person was very focused on what I mean. For instance, the person actually was, you know, looking to the, to the ground, right? to say if there is some, you know, perturbation, anything. So that way, what we did is to get an index between zero, if the person is very confused, is not thinking about uh, working, or one if the person is very focused on work. For doing that, basically, we use an, you know, an LDA classifier, and we start with the main feature of the signal by using the power spectral density. And on the other hand, 
for getting the motor imagery, what we did is to use the common spatial path and also an LDA classifier. So, in the end, we needed to combine the index provided by the attention level algorithm and the index provided by the motor imagery algorithm. In the case of the motor imagery, is I mean, it's going to provide zero, that means I'm not thinking about working, and one, I'm thinking about working. So basically, what we did is, okay, if the person is standing, I mean, the person hasn't started yet the use of the exoskeleton, so if the motor image is enough, uh, I mean, it's bigger than 0 0.7, and, uh, or, sorry, or the motor image is, you know, bigger than 0 0.6, and the tension is bigger than 0 0.4, the exoskeleton is going to be moved, okay? But if the surgery is working with the exoskeleton and the motor imagery is less than 0 0.4, the exoskeleton is going to be stopped. So we decided to implement, in this case, some tests, first of all, with healthy people, where I'm going to show you one of the videos. I want to try to, to put the, the audio because if not, Let me. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, do that. I don't know if you can use this. Okay, so basically, in this case, the person, first of all, has to be And when the person receives a command that to start to think about motor imagery, the skeleton is moved if the motor imagery level is good and the attention level is good. So basically, that was the idea. But we check that that combination of attention level with the motor imagery paradigm activates the exoskeleton in a very conservative way. I mean, I mean, it's good because we reduce the false positive rate, but as a positive, it's very conservative. So we decided to remove again the motor, uh, sorry, to remove the attention level paradigm and focusing only on the motor imagery level by using this common spatial pattern paradigm. So in that case, we went to the hospital of Toledo for performing the experiment. This is a real experiment with a young person. So in this case, it has been relaxed. The person is relaxed. And now, the assistant is going to say, imagine the work again. The person has started to think about the imagination of the movement of his leg. So the this leg is set that imagination and sends the command to the suspender. For instance, here the person has stopped. Why? Because the this leg has been detected with the imagination. As soon as the this leg detects that, the this leg sends the command to the suspender. I have to say that it was a kind of calling your person. And for that reason, the hospital asked the assistance of two people, one for helping the suspension in the back part, and other for, you know, helping, you know, the removal of the, the site. Anyway, we check that the system can be used for subject, but we realized that we had a very important problem. I was related with the time that we needed for performing the experiment. Because I mean, when we are in the lab, we say, okay, I'm going to have 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 so for that reason, we developed a different way of training the system that was based on virtual. I mean, 
basically, what we did previously is this kind of protocol. I mean, first of all, we, I mean, we put all the devices over the patient. I have to report, we have to put the, the exoskeleton, we have to put the EV system, etc. We have to put the, uh, to the gel. And after that, we perform training with exoskeleton, basically around 22 trials in the case of the patient. And after that, we perform five trials. I mean, in that way, we reduce the number of trials because before, I mean, in comparison with other experiments, but it was very long for the patient to wear the exoskeleton so many times working, you know. And for that reason, we changed the training. I mean, as you can see here, basically we split it, you know, the training, the 22 trial in this way. 10 trial were used only, sorry, were done only by using the virtual reality system and the other one were done using the exoskeleton. So basically what we did is for each patient, we did five experiments, I mean, five experiments every in different days, one experiment per day. But in the first day, the person only used the virtual reality for training the system. And we adjust, you know, the classifier. And after that, from the second session to the last one, what we did is, okay, first of all, we are going to train the system, half of the trial with the virtual reality and the other one with the exoskeleton. And then we are going to use the system in close loop. Well, basically we use the same, you know, training protocol that I have shown before. It's, it's basically the same. We adjust the one classifier for the case of the person when the person is, is, is not moving and other classifier for the case that the person is moving. And after doing that, we check that actually if the person were, if the person were using you know, the virtual reality system, the accuracy of the motor imagery detection was better. I mean, I have to say that when we started to develop projects related to motor imagery detection, what we did is to ask the people that performed, you know, a visual imagination of the motor uh, movement. I mean, if I ask you, okay, think about the imagination of your legs. Try to do that. I mean, it, Right now, if you try to think about imagination of your legs, you can do that in a lot of different ways. For instance, you can think that you are looking at you moving your legs, or no, you only are looking your legs. Or I remember some people that tell me, that told me, okay, I was thinking that I was kicking a ball. Okay, it's not true, but so we change that that kind of imagination and we try to ask the people to perform you know, kinematic motor imagery. Mm. For, basically for two reasons. First of all, because this is better, because it's more, uh, it's more similar than the way that the system is working. In the kinematic motor imagination, what you have to try to do is to try to feel what you are feeling where you are actually working. Mm. It's quite difficult because you have to think that you are feeling what you feel when you're working. So it's quite difficult. For that reason, the first session with the patients was to only to try to, uh, to teach them how to think about that. But the good thing about this is that we are sure that all the people try to do the same. So for that reason, it was very useful to use the virtual reality system for using, you know, for training the VCI. So let me show you one of the experiments that we did with, with the patient, in this video, it's very long. I'm going to, to go fast because you can see here all the time that we needed for performing one experiment with one patient. I mean, we have to put the EGG. As you can see here, it's non-invasive. We have to put the, the gel for improving the quality of the signal. After that, we have to put, you know, the exoskeleton after putting the exoskeleton we have to put the the virtual reality system and once the person has the virtual reality system over his head we started to perform the motor imagination i mean we train the user in order to perform this kind of motor imagination by using the virtual reality that way the person i mean doesn't spend so much time 
for performing the motor imagination, and even the person is not so tired when finish his training. I have to say that in this case, for training the you know the model for being in motion, we use this kind of uh, virtual reality system when the person when the person is moving actually is moving through this uh, corridor. Okay, so let me move to the next slide. So let me show you here one of the experiments that we did with one of the patients with this code, and in this case, the person has trained this individual reality system. And this was a test for, for the press because, I mean, a lot of people, it's not very popular about this kind of project. So we did a study with a real person in the hospital of Toledo. And in this case, after the training, the person, you know, now the person, I mean, the system has a, in my, in my previous panel, I can imagine that you are watching. And when the person starts to laugh and the system detects that the person is thinking about that, she has a polyphonic mood. So we verify that. We can use the virtual reality system for training the system for reducing the time of the training and for improving the result of the training. And after that, the person can be the system for, you know, for their rehabilitation. Anyway, I have to say that we needed to improve again the quality of the VCI because the accuracy of the system it was related and it was about seventy-five percent more. So we needed to improve again the currency of the VCI. So we started very recently a new project that is called Regate. It was a project, it's a project that, I mean, this project is a very big project that is done with other institutions, with the Institute Guma here in Barcelona, with the Spinal Core Injury Hospital in Toledo, and also with University of Houston and the Hospital Universidad Central de Asturias. And in that project, we are trying to develop a new kind of uh, Rehabilitation therapy. Here I'm going to talk only about something that we are doing related with the brain computer interface. So basically, in the previous uh, experiment, what we did is okay, if I want to move the exoskeleton, I heard an acoustic sound, and for that moment I have to start to think about moving my leg. So I mean, I am I am waiting for that kind of signal to start my thinking. So we decided to change that because it's not very natural. So in that case, we decided to implement an asynchronous BMI. So basically it's okay, if you want to start to think the movement of the motion, to start to move the exoskeleton, you don't need, you don't need to hear an acoustic sound. When you want, you have to start to thinking about moving your legs. But also we realized in the previous projects that uh, it's very hard for the people to be all the time thinking about moving your legs. I imagine that you have to walk around, you know, a corridor 30 seconds. To be 30 seconds, okay, I'm thinking about my legs. I'm thinking about my legs because not I'm going to be stopped. It's very hard for the people. So we decided to change that in this way. So now when I want, I start to think about the imagination of my leg. And when I do that, automatically the skeleton is moved. From that moment, I can be relaxed. And if I want to stop the skeleton, I have to think again about stopping. So now I have to think starting the gate and stopping the gate is different. Okay. But it's easier for the patient because the person is not very, you know, the person cannot be all the time thinking, I'm moving, I'm moving my leg. Okay. So in this case, we implemented a different protocol. So in this case, you can see here like uh, yellow lines. And for that moment, the person has to think about moving his legs if, you know, he wants to start, he wants to start the movement of the skeleton. And after this red line, the person has to start to think about stopping the, the skeleton. I have to say that there is not any acoustic sound. We only say to people, okay, after the red line, when you want, you have to try to stop the skeleton. Okay. So we did some kind of experiment and we verified that it's easy to start the movement of the exoskeleton. You can see here the results in green. So in green, basically the accuracy to start the exoskeleton is very good. 
and for stopping the exoskeleton, it's not so good, but it's good. I mean, it's related with 90%. But, but I have to say that this result don't, I mean, don't mean that when you think about stopping the exoskeleton is, you know, actually, is, you know, automatically stop. You need to think about that several times. For that reason, you can see here some ratio, uh, some ratio of stops. Okay. Anyway, I mean, in the end, I'm capable of stopping the sustainable and I'm, I am capable of stopping the sustainable. So let me show you here one of the videos from the experiment. You can see here in the lab that there are some lines. I mean, the lines are okay. From the red line, I have to start to think about stopping the sustainable when you want to, to stop in the sustainable. So now, here the person has thought about, you know, uh, starting the movement, and for that moment, the, the skeleton is actually moved. And in the red line, the person has to start to think about stopping the skeleton. And from that moment, if I am detecting that, the skeleton is stopped. So it's easier for the person to do that because I repeat, the person is not all the time thinking about stopping the sustainable or about being all the time thinking about moving the sustainable. So I would like to finish with some important, you know, conclusions. So first of all, we have verified that okay, people, patients are able to command a exoskeleton by means of printed people interfaces. And even we think that that can be very, you know, important for the rehabilitation. I mean, maybe we should do some clinical trials in order to check that this kind of rehabilitation is better than, you know, the traditional ones. But we need to perform clinical trials. I mean, uh, we need to perform a lot of clinical trials with a lot of different centers. But I have to say that it's quite difficult, basically because it's more or less easy uh, to get funding for performing, you know, the development of the project, but it's not so easy to get funding for performing clinical trials. So this is something that we have pending and we wanted to do in the future. So finally, I, I would like to say that, uh, let me acknowledge the, the hard work of the people of the lab, because actually they are doing the, the work. Here I'm talking about that, but they are doing <laughs> the hard work, okay? So thank you for your attention, and I will be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for this all very interesting, great work. Um, I was interested about the replication part, um, about using this type of technology for the replication. Um, so far, it looks like the exoskeleton is applying all the tasks passively, so the person is thinking of doing something, it will act like that. However, a very important part in, in replication is the assistance, the assistance as needed. So, do you have any plans to implement it with some sort of closed loop with other any type of information? What are your plans about this? Or are you going to overcome this to make the rehabilitation as efficient as possible? I mean, yeah, thank you for, for your question. You're right, I mean, basically you can do the exoskeleton in different ways. So I haven't shown here, but we started to do some experiment in Houston with the Rex exoskeleton. This is an exoskeleton that basically is like a, you know, a terminator robot because we, we put inside the robot and it's helping you, but you are not doing anything. But we were using this kind of exoskeleton from Technite that you can adjust this kind of, you know, assistance. Of course, in the end, depends on the level of, you know, of the, of the capability of the user for working. So we haven't yet uh, think about that. I mean, Basically, now we are just this kind of assistant for helping the people to, to work, but the person needs to have some kind of residual capability for promotion. Yeah. And uh, just a question Can they go phantom mode this exoskeleton? Like, 
you can, could you do, for example, single joint replication task, for example, extension of the get track extended on the on the um, the exoskeleton goes on the muscle joint and just follows the, uh, the movement without helping, and it only helps when maybe he sees that he's fatiguing or he's not able to reach the task like extending beneath a certain angle. So you mean, for instance, I can check that maybe my you know my left knee is good, so maybe I can use that information for helping to command the other one. Yeah, like say that you want to reach an extension of one and forty degrees with the knee. Mm -hmm. So the person starts doing it, and the uh, uh, kind of follows without helping. As soon as you're not able to reach, for example, then we'll, then we'll be in certain time, you change the gains and it starts helping. Could they do something like that? Uh, I mean, we haven't thought about that because we were only focused on BCI, yeah. but for, I mean, I mean, if you can, you know, work by yourself, even using information that it doesn't provide, I mean, it doesn't, you know, come from your brain, you can use it, of course. Anyway, I think that it's important to try to, you know, to involve the brain in the realization therapy. Because it's not, I mean, in the end, we are trying to move our legs, we are trying to, to try to move our legs, only to try to recover the plasticity that we have lost. So, of course, we have to try to, because, I mean, we have to try to use all that kind of information to try to facilitate the control of the, of the, the skeleton in this case. No? So, I think it's an approach that we have to, to take into account. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my question is about one of the earlier experiments you showed uh, with the GBCF. Mm -hmm. um, so for that, uh, I was wondering, is that very similar in terms of simulation to what you would have in TMS, in terms of that when you're simulating kind of your patient muscles also can get a little bit? I mean, we haven't used TMS for this. There is, I mean, from my point of view, there is a big difference between TMS and TCS. Basically, is that the TMS effects, you know, last more time than the TCS effects. But in our case, we only needed to stimulate that part of the brain to check that actually the E signal are improving, the quality of the E signal are improving. But I have to say that we haven't used the TMS, so I cannot answer your question. No, well, my question was not as a comparison. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it was more about uh, if, uh, if with TBCS, I don't know what is the level of stimulation, if it's very strong or not. But with TMS, we're trying to have facial yeah. muscles twitching and things like that right, because right. of the simulation. Mm -hmm. Is the same with TBCS? No, no. TBCS, I mean, in the air, I mean, you are introducing a very, very small, you know, covering, and it's very small. I mean, you you don't, actually, you don't feel that you are getting stimulated. Okay. So that's a problem because, again, you know, as this covering is so small, it's very difficult to stimulate the brain. But it's not so, I mean, when you are using TMS, even you can get a response of your body, for instance. You can uh -huh. you can be stimulated and suddenly you move your legs, for instance. It doesn't happen in the case of TCS. Okay. No, I was just uh, curious because uh, with TDF, for example, when it's implanted and you're stimulating, there's a change in the plasticity of the brain you can prevent. And I was wondering with, with, with TCS, if it had the same effect even in the level, but that's something that we really haven't checked. Yeah, I mean, if you talk, nice sure. Yeah, I mean, the problem is that when we did this kind of experiment, we applied the neural stimulation during at least one week, but this is very small time, you know. But, you know, I have read all the papers and that, and they say that if you want to get, you know, more permanent effects, I mean, at least that they last a few, uh, few months, you have to stimulate several months. And you have to stimulate several months and several days per week. So for that, for this kind of project, we, we couldn't do that. But if you are thinking about another approach for Robert Foley, maybe for me. Okay. Yeah, okay. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> what type of features did you find more uh, useful for identifying uh, more the image? Uh, maybe depending on the situation or not, or high viability or there were, you detected a specific uh, kind of feature more, more interesting. Yeah. 
Doctor, basically, in the end, we focus on the alpha and beta gamma, sorry, on the alpha and beta bands. I mean, because we try to focus, for instance, on the gamma band also, but we didn't get very good results. But usually, for instance, uh, we have verified that we use the common spatial pattern. It's very easy to, you know, I mean, it's very easy because the algorithm is not so difficult. And you can get good results for, you know, the uh, coding the motor environment. So right now, our best algorithm is, is based on, on common spatial pattern and focusing on that kind of lab. Okay, thank you. More questions? Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you.